um, quite impressive. So uh, we've got tonight three speakers from different uh, industries. We've got Celia Foote from uh, the NASUWT. Obviously teachers are right at the front line at the moment. And we've already had uh, quite a few uh, discussions about education, but uh, it'd be brilliant to hear what Celia's uh, been doing with her union. We've also got Max Darby, although I can't see him on the call yet, um, from PCS uh, Revenue and Customs Branch in Leeds uh, to talk to us about some of the things that the government have been doing and how that's working and obviously um, how it's working in his uh, workplace for members too. Um, he's PCS. Kevin Patterson from the CWU. Uh, clearly, postal workers have been right at the front line. Uh, and there's also a lot of challenges in the call centre environment there too. So lots of different experiences that hopefully we'll be able to uh, listen to, find interest in, and then develop our own strategies too. If, um, oh, who's, who's MJ? Says I haven't got a video. Right, okay. It'd be good. At, can you can you not find a video? Can you not do it? If, there's no no way of getting the video to work, because that would be great. Uh, no. Okay. Right. Okay. Fair enough. If you haven't got a laptop, all right, or or a phone. Your your phone will do it. Yeah. Okay. We'll see if we can get because it's going to be difficult just to listen without having the screen. I think. But anyway. Okay. So if we start off with Celia, are you okay with that, Celia? Yeah, can you hear Brilliant. me? Is that okay? Can hear you, yeah, lovely. Yeah, because technology and me do not go together. So I'm pleased to have succeeded on this. Um, just to uh, give a brief account, uh, uh, five minutes, I don't want to uh, bore you all entirely. Um, the eight unions, related to uh, education have been um, speaking, contacting, pressurising the government. It's unusual. It's been a long time since so many unions dealing with education have got together, which is an indication of just how seriously uh, the, the situation is. Um, well, at least for the, uh, the people involved, it's serious. It seems for the government, it's not too serious because they've not budged they want schools well they have they said they wanted them to open on the 1st of June and um, they've shifted to say starting from the 1st of June now some councils came out and emphatically said no they will not open on the 1st of June and we'll work towards that Leeds who have been very constructive and supportive however were not as clear but they are working closely with schools the difficulty there is the schools have got to want to co cooperate, as uh, as we all know, as um, trade unionists, responsibility for education um, has been um, greatly reduced. The LA has very little power, but it tries to use influence with the schools. Now, we've got to the stage where I think the local authority have been advising schools as much as they can. Um, and schools still are able to open from the 1st of June. The unions have opposed this, but it still leaves, as with all trade unionists, the members in a very difficult position and the unions. We cannot advise them not to attend school. They would be dismissed, so we'd be setting them up to be dismissed. It's a bit like um, members who think, uh, they're going to be wrongfully dismissed. You've got to wait actually until the dismissal comes before you can react to it. So the the NASUWT has put out a lot of information to members about risk assessments at various levels, and we're approaching it through the health and safety um, perspective because they seem to be the strongest laws. Um, quite obviously, trade union laws are. are, are um, not as strong as they were. So the health and safety um, information that's been sent out asked that schools take action on very practical things, 
it, depending on their circumstances, depending on whether they've been closed since the 23rd of March, um, whether they've been partially opened, and then the stuff for all schools. Uh, and it's to do with um, making sure the water's all right, uh, the fire doors work, that sort of thing. And then it's about risk assessments for staff health um, and well-being and pointing out the duty of care that the uh, the employer has and that being the governors and head teacher and then we've sent out more stuff which is um, template letters uh, to send to the employer the head and the governors where there are concerns raising those concerns and if they don't get the response that we think they should taking it one step further sending another letter and that happens two or three times and once we've collected the information, if the school is still not complying, our legal team will uh, look at the information it's got and try and find a legal route to challenge the schools. And unfortunately, that is lengthy. The other way is by joint action. Still the strongest way to deal with disputes. The difficulty there is, trying to get all members together to act in unison. Just before half term last week, we were getting a few queries from members about um, resuming school. Uh, there were very few. I had about three. I would expect by next Monday, our emails will be getting very busy with members being concerned. And there are, there'll be a... Celia, you've muted yourself. Thank I'm you. On. Thanks. Um, so I would imagine our casework will start to pick up from Monday. Uh, I just hope that uh, I know the head teachers unions have been uh, are amongst the eight who've been to the government. I mean, it's clearly for um, uh, purposes of getting people into work because there is absolutely no no need for children to be in school and schools could be preparing and it'll take a lot of preparation to make sure those schools are safe. And I believe from um, surveys that have been done and from people I know, parents, are, a lot of parents are very reluctant and it will take a lot of work and convincing for them to be happy about their children going to school, right? Any questions? I'm sure we will have some, Celia. Shall we maybe take the other speakers first? Because otherwise... Fine, we'll however, run... however you want to organise it. I'll go mute again. We might run out of time, I think. Yeah, but thank you very much, Celia. That was that was smashing. OK, shall we hear now from, uh, from Max Darby, who's the branch organiser of the Leeds uh, Revenue and Customs branch? Max? Thanks very much, Jane. Um, yes, so we have, uh, like everyone else, been dealing with uh, more than anything, keeping people safe on site or off site more accurately. Um, in the few weeks leading up to lockdown, um, it was very clear to us that the government wasn't taking the, uh, the advice of the, of the experts seriously. There wasn't anything in terms of infection control really seriously implemented in any of our offices, which include a couple um, in Leeds City Centre. So we have literally hundreds, if not thousands of people coming into the office by uh, public transport. And unsurprisingly, we had a huge uh, increase in people self-isolating just in the space of a week. Um, and it was because there was no hand sanitizer there was no staggered shifts there was no social distancing or anything like that so um it wasn't actually until a, a few days before the lockdown uh when one of our colleagues in manchester sadly died um that our offices were actually closed and this wasn't coordinated from the government they didn't uh, make a plan on how to do it it was individual heads of department saying our staff aren't safe go home basically. Um, uh, the only advice we really got from, from the government was the old uh, happy birthday hand-washing song, which, uh, you know, 
not particularly helpful. Um, we have actually only just managed to get all of our staff um, off of our sites in, in Leeds um, with the last ones leaving last week. Um, but we, from a national perspective, I'm quite pleased to say are working from the basis that it's not safe for us to go back to work until there's a vaccine. And that's the position that, you know, I'd encourage everyone to, to demand that your, that your trade union leaders take because it's the only way to keep us all safe, realistically. Um, I was, you know, massively reassured, as I'm sure you would be if you heard it, <laughs> if you heard the same thing, that that's the basis that we're working to. That's, that's our baseline. Um, I'll just move quickly on to the job retention scheme. So um, in our introduction, Jay mentioned that it's one of the things the government are doing to try and um, offset the economic effects of the pandemic. And it was it was launched within about a fortnight of being announced, which um, when you take into account, it's about uh, well, just over 10 million people, about 22 billion pounds spent so far. Um, it was a huge amount of work. Almost, almost everyone in HMRC was was working on the job retention scheme around the launch time. All that's now uh, fallen away, and most of us are back to our day jobs, as it were. Um, but the way that the scheme was uh, run really to me like underlined some of the government's thinking in the way this whole thing's been administered and it's both instances are from the first day it was launched um and the first was literally one of the first calls 8 a.m on the day the line opened was uh, someone who worked in a hospital and her partner worked in the same hospital they had an extremely sick son both of them had um health conditions which meant they were extremely vulnerable and their employers were refusing to furlough them so we had no process there still is no process for reporting when the employers on allowing their staff to protect themselves and it wasn't just one on the first day it was dozens amongst our small team of people our small team of 10 people um, so it just as a small sample size shows you the scale of the issue for weeks and weeks now people haven't been able to actually protect themselves um and the the other thing that really i think demonstrates what the government's thinking is and, and the timelines that they're working to is when this scheme was initially launched it was again it was the first kind of big policy to tackle COVID. It was originally launched uh, to run absolutely certainly until the 1st of June, hmm, I wonder why, and to run continuously as long as required uh, was the exact wording for as long as it's needed. Um, and the scheme as it stands prohibits employees from undertaking work for the profit of their employers. Um, and all of that's changing. Um, from the beginning of August, um, well, even at present, it's now we're now being told that the current scheme was just temporary. There was no plans to extend it. It was just for this period of time, and that from August onwards, employees can ask their staff to work part time for eighty percent of their pay. And that scheme is only set up to run until October. So it gives us a really clear guideline of what the government wants to do over the coming months, which is get as many kids back into schools and as many people back into work as possible. So we can get as much money through the retail sector, hospitality, et cetera, give the market a bit of a lift. And frankly, those of us that contract this deadly disease, it's not really their problem. Sorry, I got really cross there, so I'm just gonna have to stop. Okay, well, thanks so, so much for that. Uh, that was really interesting, Max. Thanks a lot. Okay, and if we'll take Kevin now from uh, CWU, if you want to talk to us about how things are going in your area, Kevin. Yes, yeah, yes, thanks, Jane. Uh, the I'll just mention a bit on the technical side, on the engineering side. Uh, people will have seen the attacks on, on 5G. Uh, on this spurious argument that it's somehow causing the COVID-19. Uh, there's been attacks on uh, lots of mobile services, 4G and the original ones. Uh, our engineers have been attacked and threatened. 
Uh, and to be honest, the mobile network has been what's one of the issues that kept people going, <laughs> along with the postal deliveries. Uh, and and, and it, it's kept the infrastructure of society functioning so people could actually communicate, particularly on social media when, when they're in, in, in lockdown. Uh, the initial problems we had on, on the portal side were with uh, distancing and PPE. And it was only the actions of, of uh, uh, postal workers refusing to work, uh, doing walkouts and threatening walkouts, uh, which was courageous action because you take an industrial action in the middle of a national crisis. But very quickly, those local managers and managers uh, uh, backed down and provided, uh, when they're doing the sorting, they need to, usually very close together, so they could put, they change the offices. And so that's why your post was delayed for, for, for the early, early part, and so they could sort the mail uh, with, with, with some distancing, uh, and also provide the, the, the PPE that they actually needed. Uh, and I think it's kept people communicated, linked together, and it's been really important. As a goodwill gesture, people people suspended the action. We've had two massive ballots. One was knocked back by a Tory judge uh, on a technicality. Uh, they were going to go into action to, de to defend what we call the, the universal uh, uh, service obligation, uh, which basically to most people, that would mean Saturday deliveries. Uh, Royal Mail are, are itching to do away with the Saturday deliveries. Uh, in, 10,000 job losses was, was on the agenda. They, they, that's what we wanted to do. They wanted to transform the, the Royal Mail to be a, a mainly a parcel delivery service so people could send emails and desires and, and not be using the, the, the letter post. Uh, and so, as a goodwill gesture, uh, uh, the uh, CWU said, we'll suspend our action while this crisis is on to keep the country linked together and, 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 and communicating. Uh, the response from, from Royal Mail was. Uh, on the when they had the postal workers day when people were applauding the work uh, of, 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 of the postal service to introduce all of the changes that the subject of, of a dispute uh, remove the Saturday delivery and many other things that would, would, would lead to the 10,000 uh, uh, job losses now this was done by uh, carried out by somebody called Rico back he, he, people come into the last meeting about two or three months ago uh, before the lockdown will have heard the uh, the postal rep from the CWU number one branch explaining what was happening. He was brought in from a linked company that was part of the international uh, uh, British Postal Service. Uh, and, he, uh, and he was a Swiss uh, uh, manager. And he was brought in specifically to smash the union and to bring in the, these changes. That was his, his remit. He was paid something like 5.8 million pounds uh, two years ago. Uh, they bought his contract out and the company was in and brought him in. Uh, and he was brought in specifically to, to, to do this. And that's why the union were gearing up for, for, for industrial action. But they suspended their action as a, as a goodwill gesture. And that was the response from, from Roy, Royal Mail was to introduce these changes wholesale. Now, what happened was that the, uh, the union issued uh, a letter to branches, that letter uh, uh, to every single branch in the country. They said, we're not putting up with the changes that are taking place. They in instructed every single uh, uh, worker not to implement those changes and to the reps to have no cooperation or discussion to Im implement those. Now that was an industrial action, that could have been challenging the courts. Uh, it was a dispute we were told they're having, but, but it was not giving the rest recognised notice to the employer and all these different things. So it was a real courageous decision by, by the union to actually do that. But they had absolute support from, from the membership that they were gonna, not going to give on in on this one. And within, uh, within days, uh, Pico Back uh, was sent back to, uh, to Switzerland. Uh, he's uh, handed in his notice or he's been removed by the board. Uh, he's gone anyway. The very person brought in to smash the union, to attack the union on, um, was, uh, has, has been removed, given a half a million pounds uh, package. Uh, and he's only been on the job for, for two years. So it's quite clear that it was, this was this was not a, a, a it was, was a long-term uh, appointment and he, and he's going to carry those things too so now discussions are taking place on uh on on a, on the modernization of the uh, uh, of royal mail with, with the union which is what the, the union are prepared to do uh there are lots of changes taking place they, they had an agreement uh, last year to introduce changes but with would get compensation for, for membership and be properly done with a proper union agreement so that's now taking place obviously I don't know where it's going to go. 
the Mech to have the, the same attitude and the, the same battles taking place. Uh, but it's a massive victory for, for a union uh, when most workers did not want to take forms of industrial action, wanted to stick with supporting uh, the country in a difficult situation, but they were forced into taking this action and their strong result has resulted in a massive victory for the trade union movement. So I hope people will take a message back to other trade unions and say, you know, stand firm on your rights, PPE, uh, health and safety, uh, working conditions that employers might try to sneak in, uh, because if you stand firm, you, you're going to be victorious in this present situation. Thank you, Kevin. That's brilliant. I think that's uh, a really, really good message to take away, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so I'll open it up then for contributions, questions. I'm sure lots of people have got 